Transmitting high atop of Florida's peninsula at 108 feet. This is Alpha Mike, and you are listening to Raider Cop Podcast, episode 187. As we promised, we were going to have guests, and today we've got a special one. The Dominican Law Enforcement Officers of Florida and its president, William Castro. And it's going to be an interview that I'm sure that you will like and encourage you, and that's very important. Before we start and we have our episode today, I want to give our sincere condolences to the FBI for the uh, shooting that occurred today. Um, They were executing a warrant and shootout uh, happened and two FBI agents dead, three, a total of five were shot, three in the hospital and the suspect killed him himself. He did. He did the community a lot of good. But our condolences to the friends, to the family, to the friends, and the co-workers of these FBI agents. It's always sad when we lose a family member. It's always sad when we lose a family member in law enforcement as well. All right, so how do you get in contact with us? Well, it's easy, RaiderCop.com. That will allow you to hear our podcast. And Raider Cop Nation is our official website where you can see news, information, and all our podcasts as well. So an interesting question was asked to us. And the reason we think it's interesting because it was asked to us three times in one week. How do I get the podcast? Well, it's not a strange question. There are a lot of people that have, are new to podcasting or hearing podcast, And so they believe it's like the radio. You tune in to a specific station. But here you don't. Podcasting is wherever you get your podcast. Now, if you haven't gotten a podcast, you can go Apple Products, right? Apple Podcasts. Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, TuneIn, and the list continues. Stitcher, uh, Podbeam, and on and on and on. We're everywhere. So look us up, Raider Cop Podcast or Raider Cop Nation, and we will pop up, I guarantee you. So I just wanted to say that. We promised you a guest. We brought a guest we haven't done this really since we, when we first started uh, back in 17, we did. And of course, we were under another name at that time. And then we, we changed it to Raider Cop Nation. And uh, we concentrated on the myself and the co-host. But now we're going to go to a new era uh, as well. We're going to start interviewing and having guests. Not uh, a whole lot but probably five, six in this coming year. And uh, it was really personal to me that we do this today on an association that gives back to the community as police officers are consistently the victims of hate groups all around. We believe that we have to encourage others to build them up and that's why we're happy that the Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida are here with us today. On some other notes, the Hardy's list on the website Raider Cop Nation is coming along just fine. We ask for your patience on that as we develop a community that does not really exist. What do I mean by that? A lot of people are seeking privacy. They're They're looking for an example. They're looking to get off 
these bugging devices that are called Apple and Google. So a lot of people don't know that there's other options in cell phones that are made by Lennox. But they're not really there yet, but they're soon to come. So that's why it takes so long for us to complete our list. Well, it's time to bring in our guest, Mr. William Castro, president of the Dominican Law Enforcement Officers of Florida, a interview that I know you truly will enjoy. And just like we promised in 2021, we were going to have guest appearances. Now, we hadn't done that since we started this podcast in 18, but um, it is important. And of course, the pandemic slowed a lot of things down for, for us, but we thought it was important uh, to have guest interviews. And of course, the the first ones that you have are very important too, because it tells the audience, well, this is not going to work. Oh yes, it is going to work. So we we pick something that's very special to us, and that's law enforcement, and particularly, as I said prior, uh, the Dominican Law Enforcement Officers of Florida, and its president, William Castro. So you'll most likely, I'm almost guaranteed, I'm going to enjoy this interview. William is a very well-spoken individual, so it is my honor to have William come on the program. William, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I greatly appreciate you uh, letting us come on this platform and uh, getting people to uh, learn about our organization and, and the, the, the great work we're doing in the, in the community. It's, you know, our doors are always open, especially to law enforcement. So you guys are always welcome. Now, before we start, you know, a lot of people are reading into the headline. Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida. So they're, they're trying to pin you into a box. They're Dominican and they're in Florida and they're cops. But we know that it's much more than who you are. So if I was back in high school with William, who is William? Well, first and foremost, before I answer your question, I just want to send my uh, sincere condolences to the uh FBI and uh, the law enforcement community for the loss of its two agents this morning in the city of Sunrise. Uh, it was unfortunate to hear about that incident early this morning. Uh, once again, anytime things like this occur, they affect us all regardless of what department we, we work for. And, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to send that, those condolences out uh, real quick. So how would I describe myself? Uh, if, if someone was to ask me, I think I'm always the person that's willing to to help the next man up or the next person. Um, someone who's very giving, someone who is very um, committed to uh, to the community, a person that doesn't forget their roots, a person that doesn't forget the struggles that uh, that our parents or the ones before us laid the foundation for us and the struggles that they went through in order for us to be where we're at today. So I'm a person that always gives acknowledgement and respect to the those that, that came before us and those that set the path uh, for us today uh, as successful uh, members of society. Great, great um, background and great personality. Now, you get involved in law enforcement. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, well, actually... I grew up in New York City. Um, I had a very heavy influence. Um, uh, I'm sure you're aware of what's called the PAL program or the Police Police Athletic League uh, yes. program. They they're all over the country. Uh, particularly, this program um, played a very important role in my uh, growing up in the inner city, in, in New York City, in particular. Um, during the 80s, when I was a young uh, a young person, um, a lot of things were going on. The, the, the crime was skyrocketing. Uh, uh, we had the crack cocaine epidemic um, ravishing the streets. And 
as a mom who uh, was working two jobs, she was worried about myself and my older brother. So the police athletic program uh, was what we did during the summer uh, to keep us away from all the mischief and things that were going on in the streets. So I will go in, I will go to the police athletic program that was in my neighborhood. And that's where I had the first one-on-one -on -one interaction with retired law, with law enforcement officers, someone who retired, some were still active that mm -hmm. participated in the police athletic league. And there is where I actually got intrigued by the type of work that the police officers were doing with the community when the uniform was off. When they were when they were uh, talking to us about about you know things that were going on on a more personable level, when they were playing sports with us and athletics, whether it was basketball, uh, kickball, softball, we were able to interact with them the way you would with let's say an uncle or a neighbor or someone that's a friend of the family. So that perspective sort of changed a lot uh, about how I perceived law enforcement from the moment they're working to the moment they were uh, with the kids. And that basically opened the doors for my uh, ambition to one day be in a position where I could do the same. And that's why I got intrigued uh, uh, with the law enforcement. Obviously, I didn't go towards the route of local police. I ended up uh, working for a federal government agency that happens to be law enforcement. But overall, that's where I got my uh, my my want to do something uh, law enforcement related, even though I didn't study particularly anything that had to do with law enforcement when I went to school, I sort of veered back to to uh, to that career later on as I got more mature. But obviously, what you said was very important. The PAL uh, was an influential factor in your life growing up, and. It's it's kind of slowed down in, in this era, and I would I would love to see that come back. I think it was very proactive with the community. I know exactly what you're talking about. I was also born and raised in New York City, of course, a different era than you. But I remember the PAL. They were very big in New York City, the boxing program, and yes. uh, especially, and it really helped a lot of a lot of. Um, younger kids and youth at that time. So you're absolutely right. 100%, I agree with that. So you get involved in uh, federal law enforcement, and during the course of your employment, you come across uh, this organization we're going to talk about. How did you get involved with them? Why did you get involved with them? Yes, well, about 10 years ago, I decided to make a move and uh, move to the state of Florida. Well, actually, I was, it, it's funny because I was, I was ready to transition from New York City to another uh, location. And it happened that the job brought me over to the state of Florida, South Florida in particular. So as I was working here, when I started my law enforcement career about 10 years ago, I noticed that I kept bumping into ex-New Yorkers and fellow Dominicans like myself uh, here in Florida. And I said, you know what? We have numbers down here. I was really shocked because coming from up north, predominantly, you know, the uh, Latino community there is uh, Puerto Rican and Dominican and Colombian. But down here, it sort of is different. And I started bumping into uh, colleagues from other agencies and other departments. And we said, you know what, we have numbers down here. Why not get together and start, uh, you know, talking about things we could do to help our community locally and also back home in the Dominican Republic. So myself and another law enforcement officer by the name of Cesar Marti decided to come together and form the framework for what will be called the Dominican Law Enforcement Officers of Florida. And that's how it truly began in about 2017 is when we established the, uh, the organization and we uh, presented it to a couple of other law enforcement officers and see if they were, they were on, bo on board with the, uh, the idea of forming this, this uh, organization. Now, prior to, to doing this, had you been involved with any other similar groups? 
Um, not a not in an organized manner, other than you know belonging to uh, unions and things like that. Mm-hmm. But as far as a, a particular group, uh, no. And in, on an individual basis, what I will always do is you know help out whenever natural disasters were occurring and things like that. Um, you know we were donating non-perishable goods, foods, and uh, you know items and things like that for hurricanes relief reliefs and things like that for other places. So, but the, the common thing that, that we had is that we all kept bumping into each other down here, down in South Florida particularly, and that's when we say, hey, you know, why don't we do something uh, different, something special, something that, has, that hasn't, has not been done down here in the state of Florida? And that's more or less how, how it, it all began. Now, I do want to compliment uh, the fact that uh, Dominican officers, especially in the city of New York, have really climbed the ranks of the NYPD from maybe when I was a kid or growing up in New York City where you wouldn't really see minorities. Uh, They were there, of course they were, but not in the magnitude as you see it today, and especially uh, Dominican officers which have gone up to ranks. And you're seeing that similar trend here in Florida, what you spoke about. But... Uh, maybe some of the audience has, you, you said the point they were that we had numbers down here, so we decided to organize. Now, this organization is not just an exclusive to Dominicans, correct? That is correct. It, it is not just for Dominican uh, law enforcement officers. It's actually an organization that's open both to the community and to active and retired law enforcement officers of all backgrounds. Um the only common thing is that the group that organized it decided to do something in homage or paying respect to our heritage of the Dominican heritage, sort of similar like how you have, you know, the Irish American Law Enforcement Society or the Asian American Law Enforcement Society. It basically was designed to show the community that's growing here in South Florida that you do have professionals that come from these areas or come from Dominican Republic to serve as an example also to youth that might feel like there's no chance for them to to come to the United States and, and be successful or for immigrants that, that come to the U.S. so they could see that, hey, look, there's a set of, there's a group of guys, uh, an organization that has done, you know, moved up the ranks uh, and become professionals. Um, Recently, we, you know, uh, the last census uh, data that came out, uh, Dominican Americans are have made up, you know, the fifth largest Latino group in the U.S. Um, uh, is a is a statistic that a lot of people don't realize because you don't think of like Dominicans being such a a big, you know, a big group as far as when it comes to the Latino population here in the U.S. But they're, they're, as according to the data, it's almost over surpassed over two million. Uh, yeah. Dominicans, so that that's a lot of people, you know, from a small island, particularly not that big, as far as you know, in in, uh, in size and population. So do you figure you have almost two million here in the U.S. and uh, it, it, it's paid a big influence not only in the ranks in law enforcement, but other important positions uh, in professional professional pos- uh, positions in society as well. Very well said. You know, I was involved in. Um, associations as well in my career, and I did that for close to 30 years. And a lot of people that didn't understand that, they go, well, why do you have to put an ethnicity into the name of the organization? And like you said, the Irish organization or Italian or whatever have you. And I said, well, because it's twofold. Number one, as a group, you want to represent your heritage, who you are, and you want to send that message to the younger folks um, to, to, that they can do it too. And number two, those people that embrace your mission statement are always welcome. Nobody's excluded as long as they embrace the mission statement. So you, you explained that very well. Uh, sometimes it loses in the message with the listener. They're like, oh, well, you know, that's not me, so I, I'm, I'm tuning out. It does represent all of us in some fashion, some way that we have to kind of understand. Now, this, this yeah, that- 
organization correct. is nonprofit, correct? That's correct. We're set up as a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization. And uh, we're, we're going towards our fourth year. This, this upcoming June will become our fourth year. Okay. Now explain a little bit further to the organization on the 501c status. A lot of, it loses in translation to a little bit of the younger generation. Yeah, correct. So basically when you're forming uh, an organization, you have to have a purpose for your organization. Um, and basically you have, when you hear non for profit, a lot of people, you know, misconstrued what, what, you know, what that means because there's other non for profits, but there are other, there are different types of non for non for profits. So you basically got C3s, you got C4s, but the purpose overall purpose of each designation is different within the, you know, the, the definition of the uh, what the IRS deems you as a as a group, um, for example, as a C3 organization, our sole purpose is to serve a common good for a particular cause. In our example, we're organized as a non a non for profit group that is dedicated uh, to coaching and mentoring uh, children in the community and stuff like that, working towards you know promoting educational uh, encouragement, saying no to drugs, gangs, and misconduct. So that's basically what the organization is designed for to, you know, the empowerment and betterment of a specific cause in society. As to where if you have a 501c4, perhaps it's more of like a union that represents you for labor rights and um, also can engage in endorsement of political candidacies and things like that to that nature. So they have a, a little bit more of a uh, separation as far as to their potential involvement in any type of political affiliation or any type of political promotion. With a C3, you basically, uh, basically nonpartisan and you're there basically for the community as to where C4s, you're more geared towards representation of a certain group where then you can have a more vocal uh, approach as far as you know your your views and things like that. Uh, so in these C in these C3s, a lot of designations would be like community programs for elderly, uh, perhaps certain types of religious groups or churches might be designated as C3s and things like that. So that's where the, this distinction is with our organization and our 501c3 versus perhaps a C4 that's a more, you know, uh, vocal group for a specific type of uh, mission that's, um, you know, more politically driven or more rights related as far as, you know, bargaining contracts and litigation and stuff like that. Excellently said. Now, we're going to trans transfer a little bit to the business plan. Um, you know, every organization or corporate structure has to have a business plan. What is the mission statement of the Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida? Yeah, like I briefly touched before, the overall purpose here is to bring together law enforcement officers and the community to be able to give back. Um, like I said, through our line of work, we're able to see the I don't want to say the bad side because you don't want to characterize it as the good side or the bad side, but you're able to see the reality of what occurs in the community. And there's always also a positive side to things that, that could be coming out of the community. You know, a perfect example I'd like to give you is like in our line of work, we're always the ones that are generally incarcerating young, you know, young immigrants or, or young members of society. But at the same time, on the other end, we could also be that hand that reaches out to them, that prevents them from going down the path of, of you know, of getting involved in, in a negative aspect with law enforcement. So the, the mission of the organization is basically like I touched briefly before, we're here to mentor and coach these young uh, adults there in the community. We're here to serve as role models to these children. Um, we're very dedicated in, into making sure that any interaction that we have 
with this organization is a positive one. We're trying to create what's what's called you know positive change within the community, bringing back some of those core things like we briefly touched that programs that I participated and a lot of our guys participated that perhaps the departments have sort of you know shed away from and and we're trying to do this more on a personable level based you know in regardless of what the department policies are as citizens we're able to do it and that's why the organization was formed and that's the business model is basically gain trust from the community to be able to do things in the community to bring the community together trust us in law enforcement and then it allows us to more easily you know do our work in the community when we're on the job uh, we rely on uh, donors we rely on corporations to help us keep our program going um, and um, very very receptive up to this point and I, I'm very grateful for all the different uh, police other police departments that have reached out to us and for all the other members that have come come together and, and decided that they wanted to be part of this this growth this movement that we have here known as the UFL or the Dominican law enforcement officers organization. Now, we looked at the mission statement. What are the goals or the future aspirations of the organization? Where do you, you, and especially this is a great question for you as one of the founders. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a very good question. And, you know, they say that usually within the first five years of a nonprofit's existence is where, is where you're either going to make it or break it. And we're getting very close to that threshold of that five years. And we've already been able to do so many great things within the community. We've been able to directly impact the lives of hundreds of students, not only here locally in, in the state of Florida, but also abroad in the Dominican Republic. So when I, when I reflect on where we were four years ago and where we are now and where we're headed towards the future, I'm super, super optimistic that this organization is going to gain momentum. The goals that I have here is to continue to expand our base, continue to form alliances with not only other law enforcement officers, other law enforcement agencies, other nonprofit organizations, and other members of perhaps you know the community that want to come together with elected officials, obviously, to help us move. And I really want to focus in in the future is. Continue to expand on the programs that, that we currently have with the youth mentoring. Um, this year, we're, we're set to launch uh, a scholarship fund that could reward good students um, academically and also students that are, are you know good in the community that do community service and able to to um, to provide them with some type of financial uh, assistance to further their education. And also, uh, you know, be able to reach children not only within the local boundaries, but perhaps in other places or other countries that might look at us as, uh, you know, role models and things like that. So I want to expand our horizons not only to South Florida, not only to Central Florida or the western part of the peninsula, but also perhaps other countries around the world, other places where um, we could make an impact where likely the resources might not be as, as available as, as, you know, as our local children here in, in the state. Now, if I'm listening to this podcast and I'm really enthusiastic by what I'm hearing, but I'm not local, I'm not in Florida, how can I get involved in the organization? That's a very excellent question. Not only if you're not here, but let's say you're not a law enforcement officer. I get this a lot through our, through our uh, social media and also through our um, email directly through our website. They, hey, uh, how can I be part of this organization? I'm not in law enforcement. And I explained to them, this is a collaborative effort between law enforcement officers, community, businesses, and individuals that wanna also you know, chip in and, and help. You could become a volunteer with us um, you could you could come with us to one of our community events, whether it's a turkey giveaway, a community cleanup, um, a youth mentoring session. But we want to showcase successful business people or successful professionals, not only from the law enforcement careers, you know, but also other careers, successful lawyers, 
other entrepreneurs, like I said. So you could also volunteer. You could become a sponsor of the organization. And if you happen to be a law enforcement uh, a uh, member of the law enforcement community, you can also sign up for membership, whether you're uh, retired or whether you're still active. And also you could just be a supporter by uh, spreading the word. And that's that very correct. important also. You know, yes, some... that is correct. Now, uh... we, we've been very fortunate. Sorry to cut you off. We've been very fortunate that we've gotten a lot of support from uh, uh, people up north. Uh, as far as people on the West Coast have also reached out to us and commended us for the work that we're doing. Well, yeah, that was a part of what I was uh, about to say. I, I'm sure that there are people um, not directly involved in the association, but, you know, they, they want to help, they want to support, they want to spread the word, and I'm sure they've contacted. And, of course, you can. You can do that just by uh, forwarding um you know, information on social uh, media about the organization helps the organization as well, puts it in a positive light. What's coming up for the uh, Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida in uh, 2021 that we can, you know, look forward to? And I know we're in the middle of pandemic and all that, so it's a little difficult to maybe answer, but uh, always hoping for the best. What could we be, expect? Yes, like last year, 2020 was probably our more our most difficult year. We had to uh, change not only in our volunteer work, we also had to change how we do things in life in general. So that has shown us to be more resilient and be more um, uh, dedicated to change. So we've been able to adapt certain changes, keep it in keep it in mind, safety and social distancing guidelines and things like that. So we learned a lot from 2020, where in the middle of the year, we had to postpone uh, or or cancel a lot of our uh, youth mentoring and our events because of the pandemic. But we were able to luckily, uh, thank God, we were able to, the back end of the year, we were able to get together and, and, and provide uh, uh, turkeys and food for Thanksgiving. And also, we also had our our uh, toy drive that we do at the end of each year. So we sort of learned on the fly on how to conduct them, on how to be safe. So for 2021, we're we're planning to to start off where we sort of left off in the year 2020 with with all of our events being uh, with the safety of the community being a you know number one priority and uh, keeping social distancing. With that said. Uh, we have planned to resume um, our youth mentoring sessions, which we do in the high schools, also uh, in the community and a couple of other private uh, uh, entities that allow us to go in and talk to the children and after school programs, as well as some other organizations. We also have set up uh, our kickoff event that we do in the spring to basically introduce the objectives of the organization or any new ideas or programs that we have. So that's program in May. Uh, the, the annual trip to the Dominican Republic, which we take school supplies and, and clothes and uniforms for the kids that, that go to school. We have that uh, lined up that, that usually takes place on the second week of August. Um, we also have our annual gala and we also have scheduled uh, our Thanksgiving drive for the month of November and also the toy drive for the month of December. Now, in between these events, we we get invited to take place in uh, a lot of different things that, are, that happen in a couple of different cities here in the state. Um, one year we did a collaboration with one of the cities and we did a cleanup of a community where we're able to help, you know, get rid of garbage in the streets. And we look to bring students along with us as well that want to do community service and get out there and know what it is to, to do something positive. So we're looking to hopefully be able to uh, get a couple of uh, children from from the community to take place in those events and, and uh, things like that. We also have scheduled a couple of um, outings with different uh, enforcement organizations in order to expand our 
our reach and team up and do things together. We're looking forward to a lot of those things and and hopefully the the pandemic will will allow us to uh, to fight through and get and get our mission through. Well, we're looking forward to, to a very exciting 2021 and of course, hopefully a safe one uh, due to the COVID uh, situation that's all over the world. If I'm listening to this and I'm excited and all that, but uh, I want I, I want to bond a little bit more with the Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida. What's your website? Are you on social media? How can they get more? Yes. Our website is www.dleofl.org. You can also find us on Instagram at D-L-E-O-F-L or D-O-F-L, which is our acronym. They're welcome also to uh, shoot us an email. Our email is info at D-L-E-O-F-L.org. Or if they want to call the office, they're welcome to. Uh, I, get, I get calls all the time from, from people in the community that want information or, or just are curious about the program and want to help. Their number is 305-532-0464. Okay, and we're going to go ahead and link the social media and the website on a show notes. So if you didn't have a pen available and you didn't write it down, it's on the show notes and you can uh, copy from there. I've extended to William and the Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida, a spot on Raider cop nation of uh, the podcast. And why? Because I believe strongly in these types of organizations and mentoring children, I think it's the foundation of who we are as a people. And I extend that invitation publicly as well. I know that they have to go through a board and decide um, if, if it's a good thing or if it's not time consuming. But if they're willing to accept it, I'm willing to give it a, a spot with us and they can transmit their message their mission statement and their goals to the audience that are liking what they hear like I am. So thank you once again. Thank you. <laughs> it, it is, it's, it's our honor and pleasure to have you here today. You are a well spoken uh, individual. Uh, you are, uh, you know, just to give a little bit more of a background yesterday, me and uh, myself and William, we were uh, programmed to do the interview and we had technical difficulties on my end, of course. And uh, we we spoke for quite a while and then we had done, I believe, uh, several days earlier. We spoke for about an hour. And, um, you know, I'm a very good judge of character and I could tell you that, William, everything you heard on this podcast has not deviated one bit from the passion that he has inside him. So I congratulate you for that passion. And I also uh, embrace that passion as well. Any final, any final remarks? I just wanted to take this opportunity to, to tell everyone that the current situation that we're going through with the pandemic and certain uh, issues in society are things that we could all get through together if we have patience for one and one another, if we set aside perhaps our differences or our views of opinions and and not forget that we're all in this together regardless of our beliefs, of our race, of you know, our gender or whatever your orientation might be. And and, and we're here just to, to to help one another. And if you take that approach, uh not only you know with whatever is happening, but in life, you you will be able to get through easier in your day. I know sometimes your day feels like it's all you know it's all is not having a good day and it's awful. But if you just take a moment to breathe and and think and say, you know what, I'm gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this. Everything will be all right. And we sort of take that mentality and sometimes just like the saying goes, take a chill. <laughs> yeah. everything will be all right 
that everything will be all right. Because I know we, we all go through it in, in my profession, my personal life, uh, you know. So re- remember, no matter what's going on in the current events that are going on in, in, in our society, if we treat each other with respect, if we're able to put our differences aside, it's, the world's going to be a better place. And we got to teach that to our children because kids are watching your reaction. So remember that. Excellent words of um, of wisdom that we are receiving here today. Mr. William Castro, we thank you for being here today. You've made us uh, a happier, brighter, and more intelligent community as a result of it. Thank you once again for the invitation. Take care and God bless. I told you he was eloquent, well-spoken, intelligent, and we are all better as a result of listening to this podcast. I have a passionate heart when it comes to associations because they're volunteering their time in mentoring and making the community a lot better. And sometimes the community is far-reaching as far as going back to their country, and in this case, the Dominican Republic, providing certain things that would be very difficult for those children in there in that country as school supplies and so forth. But that interaction is probably going to mean a lot to a lot of those kids that most likely at one point or another will make that transition to this country or to law enforcement. It's well worth it, and we don't have it enough. Today's law enforcement departments are focusing more on having coffee. And I'm not here to kick anybody in the shins that do that have that program, but sometimes you got to reach out a little bit more. And this is that more. So it has its place in our society. It has its place in our law enforcement as well. We don't have a law enforcement agency in this country that all looks the same. You might have that in another country, but this is a melting pot. So we come in all shapes, sizes, colors, accents, some born here, some foreign born, but all of us bring individual talents. And that incorporates the family of law enforcement. Expanding that to your own is important too because it preserves the heritage into growing into law enforcement. It's just not something, well, well, that was in their era many years ago, but we don't, we don't uh, believe in law enforcement. There are some cultures that don't trust law enforcement because the law enforcement in their country was corrupt. So therefore, they grew up with a distrust to law enforcement making this bond even bigger. So I promised it, and you got it. Our invitation is there, and I know that uh, we will be having more episodes in the future with them as as events happen and, and stuff like that. So it won't be the last that you hear of the Dominican law enforcement officers of Florida. All right, so coming up next... We have episode 188. Remember, we are on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. That's a big lineup in one week. And on Saturdays, we do two shows, the Buccaneers show. Don't ask me who I'm going for in the Super Bowl. Don't. The Buccaneers show is mostly about that community that we're setting up after the election. And... The word, and that's most spiritual. Why? Because 
you know, on this program, you listen about law enforcement concepts. You listen about those things that affect law enforcement. And you listen how to train, be better, uh, equipment, guns, and so forth. We we have uh, platforms for everything law enforcement provides. and But you need spiritual, too. You can't put God in a shoebox. He's a very important piece in everything that you will hear on this microphone. So put on the armor is the episode that's coming up, 188. And February 8th, he's been on the on-deck circle, my friends, for about nine months. Kilo Sierra salivating, waiting eagerly. Can't wait to grab the microphone and come back in. February 8th, we have a CCW carrying a concealed weapon and defense against a <clears throat> excuse me, a mob. And um, we've seen that on television, the Capitol and, and cities and taking over large sections of cities. There is no right and wrong. I always said back in the summer, how do you distinguish between a peaceful protester and a rioter? The rioter's the one committing crime, felonies. It's that easy. The peaceful proster, protester is doing that peacefully. So it's not very difficult to understand. To understand. So with that being said, Kilo Sierra is on the on deck circle, and we can't wait to have him back. He will be uh, featured on Mondays, and he'll be doing guns, 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 and more guns. We also know that the Second Amendment is under siege, so we'll be having some shows about that. Kilo Sierra, I can't wait to get my co-host back up there. Now, remember, the last time we spoke to Kilo Sierra, about nine months ago, he said that he was thinking about doing his own platform, either a blog or something else. Well, don't tell him nothing. But we're going to keep him up to that promise. So when he comes up on February 8th, shh, don't say nothing. But I'm going to spring it on. Okay. As always, it is my honor and pleasure to be your host on Raider Cop Podcast. Continue to pray for yourself because without you in the game, we have nothing. Continue to pray for your family, your friends, your community, and most importantly, for the law enforcement agencies that serve you. And how and why would we forget our beautiful country that needs more prayer more than ever the United States of America. This is Alpha Mike, and I'm out.